Welcome to CEO Money. I'm Michael Yorba. Thanks for joining us. Joining with us, I have Jennifer Jiang, co-founder of Block Test, with us today. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thanks, Michael. My pleasure. All right. Now, why did you change your career as a senior investment banker to a blockchain entrepreneur? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I think two things triggered me um, to think. Right, like last year. Um, you know, like JP Morgan used to run the global crown jewel of the money market fund in the U.S. Treasury. And until last year, uh, it was the number one position was taken by someone. Do you want to guess whom? JP Morgan? Yeah. Uh, so that number one position for the money market, money market fund was taken, overtaken by Alibaba. Ah, okay, makes sense. Uh, that you were about fund. So it's kind of like where that, that competition come from, right? Which is, you know, we are seeing the financial industry, a landscape changing that is coming. And we may see the competition and the cooperation happening in an unprecedented way. And I feel like this is the right time to running at a frontier of the financial innovation, which I think in the last 17 for 50, 17 years, literally, in the financial industry, we're still uh, not much seeing much of big changes since 1970s. But I think right now, it's about another wave of changes to come. That's why I choose to invest my career uh, to something different. OK, wise move. I'm sure you make good choices along the way, too. What about the gap for Main Street adoption to blockchain? Because I've seen quite a quite a step there. and. That's that's the vacuum I, I see you feeling. But talk to me about that. Yes, um, you know the from mainstream. Like my first impression was Bitcoin, right? Like when I first encountered this thing was like, what another innovation of a fraud, right? It's 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 just so unbelievably uh, strange. Uh, but when I tend to understand from really bottom up, trying to understand the technology, I realize it's such a piece of elegant innovation. That's the word I have to describe it. And I'm not too sure many people have this opportunity like me by studying at MIT for a full year trying to understand was such a technology's beauty and an intricacy. And I feel like there's still so much hypes and fantasies about this technology, what it can promise uh, to bring to the society and found the truth. Um, so I feel like, okay, uh, there's so much we can do with this technology, but there are too much fantasies as well. And um, and the mainstream adoption, I think, comes from right the data integrity, the regulation. There's just so much we can fill in to make that gap smaller. As someone who comes from the traditional financial industry, who knows what people are thinking and trying to say do our share of contribution to fill in that gap. And I would say the uh, biggest gap right now is really on the uh, on the risk, and uh, and what what are the sort of the potential um, um, do's or can do's that blockchain can bring to us? Um, you let, know, there's so many. Sorry. Let me jump in there for a second. You'd mentioned the hypes and the truths. And the gaps. Let's let's start by giving an example of some of the truths about blockchain versus the hypes, and then where you see the gaps are going to be filled. Right. Um, well, this is uh, almost the first time in the human history we see a successful experiment that of value transfer from the three-way three-way of connection into two-way. Uh, well, people tend to underestimate like how difficult Bitcoin came to this world because it seems like all of a sudden become all the headlines. But the fact is over the last 30 years, there've been hundreds and thousands of trials in the cryptocurrency have failed. Um, you know, the achievement of building up a communal consensus, decentralized communal uh, mechanism to make the three-way value exchanges possible into two ways is unprecedented. And think of how much we can do with this two new way, face-to-face, peer-to-peer transactions that we can do. Um, um, and the fantasy, though, is like we all, 
using our imagination how much this decentralization and uh, permanency of the data integrity can bring to us. But we're still far away. We're still at a very, very early stage of using that technology. It's like imagine a baby taking its first step can run a marathon, marathon tomorrow. So between now and then, there's a huge gap of development. And the technology, I mean, is still uh, you know, moving in a much slower uh, pace than the money flows, inflows. And with that, so much fantasy that the money trying to create uh, for the deliverers that deliverables that blockchain can enable us, um, you know, there are just so many uh, potential hypes that we're seeing in our market. Do you see uh, well, the, the money grabbers? Yeah. Do you see that the the really the pathway through to to be a, a broader acceptance of blo blockchain is going to be the smart contracts being able to be used in a variety of ways beyond what they're doing now? Uh, yes, and. Uh, and I think the industry adoptions uh, needs to be the number one to come. Like the real case problem and challenges need to be solved by the blockchain technologies. For example, this supply chain management or the data sharing process in the medical records. And we need to see the real adoption of this technology to facilitate what cannot be otherwise achieved. That is really the breaking through the value add of technology you know, blockchain can enable. And with that, with additional productivity it can bring to the society, money justifies its value. And right now we're forefronting, like front running all these potential benefits. Um, and we're expecting, and it's just many other new technologies, probably 95% of the new uh, trials will fail. Uh, but it seems we're at a stage that how many, uh, you know, haven't done their really the uh, deserved due diligence to find out what parts of the technology can solve what parts of problems. Like blockchain is not a panacea. It's not a solution for every problem, nor it's not a hype uh, as many people claim. So it's more of an in-between. Um, so where is it really the problem blockchain can solve? That is you know, the trust agent problem that we think. Um, and we need to find a real industry, uh, industry problem that can add value. I agree with you. Let me move forward for just a second here. Now, let's talk about the difference in fintech in development between the U.S. and China, or say internationally. G give us your your take on that. Right. Um, you know, the digital banking, uh, what we say, the mobile banking in China, uh, in terms of payment, is already fifty times more than in U.S. Uh, well, given the sheer size of the U.S. in the international market and, and the breadth and the depth, and the comparison in the digital banking is very striking. Why is that? You know, basically, you know, U.S. has been successful in its financial markets, and it's very built on like decades of very complicated infrastructure construction. There's no way for any other emerging markets to catch up if they follow the same trail of growth. So many of the emerging markets, as we've seen in China or in Southeast Asia, they leap forward with individual-based mobile banking facilities. And that are, there is a big sort of requirement for that to happen to really um, you know, make it successful, that you basically need to uh, be able to modulize a lot of functions in the financial system. So for all these different, like create mini stories, uh, happen at individual level, be able to combine into a big narrative in the financial markets. Um, that requires a lot of data work, and that requires potentially in the future for blockchain to play in a role to integrate the data in a very trustworthy way. Um, if I were to say, um, going forward, I mean, U.S. is still carries weight, and that is, you know, pros and cons of any further development, because any move of, you know, big elephant will make a huge wave in a wave uh, in the market. But that's why some of the markets in like Korea, they just announced they're going to invest $100 million in the blockchain technology for the it so cross the garment functions. They are able to experiment and making leap forwards uh, in some of the technology adoption. Um, 
that's what I see the differences. And and eventually that brings, uh, you know, it more inclusive of the community in terms of the technology benefits for everyone. Um, I mean, this is, I see sort of the big guys versus the small people, uh, small guys in the world stage in the innovation, but in generally in the financial markets, you know, mobile banking and the digital banking, I think that is probably one area that global markets will outpace uh, U.S. for a certain quite a period. And that pace, when do you see that that is really going to come to the surface? I know what it's, it's brewing underneath the surface right now because the major banking systems that have been in place are already, there's still these behemoths, but how do you see that transition going on a, on a timeline? Do you, do you see certain events? I guess I'm trying to word it the, the right way so we can give me a good answer on this. Certain events taking place over certain periods of time to be able to interconnect the entire global banking system versus pockets in different geographical regions um, outpacing each other. Do you, do, you, do you understand what I'm trying to ask? Yes, yes. So you're asking about what will be the trigger events or something like that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think people tend to overestimate um, the technology impacts for a short run and underestimate that for the long run. Uh, I may not say like next year or next month, but definitely I think in the course of the next decade, uh, 10 years, I think the fundamentally the, um, uh, the business model will be changing and together with that, the financial system. Um, let me give you an example. I think, um, you know, nowadays I just read uh, like McKinsey's um, report talking about what we say the gig economy, right? The independent workers, like 90, uh, 90 million or something like 40% or more American workers are like prefer to choosing the freelance workers or independent workers. You will not see that happening overnight, but it's going to be the trend. And the more and more young, I would say the millennials, will tend to work on their own. So how are they going to incorporate or integrate their individual work, even the finance or production, into the economy, the gig economy? Um, this is where we see woes. It's going to see that happening in the decade time. Um, and with that, you know, that's why I always, always say, you know, um, the, um, you know, talents are distributed everywhere, but opportunities are not. Um, and with that, I think gradually in the decades time, I think more uh, young talents and the contributions from all over the world be more equally brought into um, the global economy uh, ecosystem. And with that, I would see um, we may happen uh, to see different track of growth of the economy. Uh, like we see, you know, the example of the Alibaba versus Google Fund versus JP Morgan's money market fund. They are not really competitive, right? They are not taking away JP Morgan's share, but recreating the entire blue ocean of economy and fund raising opportunities or investment opportunities um, to the economy, to the equation. So. I would think that so sort of it's like a lotus effect. It comes from a small base, but it will strive uh, and give it a time. Okay. All right. Let's let's turn the conversation to you. Um, you co-founded co Block Test, and I wanted to understand um, your aspirations uh, for achievement with it. Uh, yes. Um, I just feel like this blockchain technology, together with many data technologies like artificial intelligence and IoT for that sake to connecting the physical world with the digital world. Together, you are going to create such strong impact for our future economy coming forward. And the problem is, uh, you know, again, as we mentioned, the money flows much, much faster than technology moves. Um, and there have been so much, you know, investors um, anxiety talking about, am I missing out? It's like a big fear of missing out of the big next Google on the blockchain. And we see just so much uh, hypes and money grabbers, like with so much what we say to token insurance in the last two years. 
you know, don't don't get me wrong. I still feel like you know the token um, issuance, or it's one of the interesting experiment in terms of the financial market fundraising and the building up the new ecosystem for the entrepreneurs. But um, how to validate all these fictions that you know each company is promising, right? We are doing a lot of. Um, Fictions anyway, like for the IPO market, right? When at Wall Street, we're talking about how great this company company is going to be. We're talking about next three to five years. These are fictions too, you know, in essence. But at least they can be done in a more trackable and credible way. Uh, and investors can do the due diligence to see how reliable these fictions can turn into reality. And in the blockchain space, Still, there's so few people understanding the blockchain in depth, and there's so much claims that are saying we can achieve this and that, uh, and with the fact that is probably not many of them are, are true either way. So I felt like, right, with the uh, block test, we're trying to do the technical due diligence in a more thorough way for the investors and for enterprises that want to adopt um, the blockchain innovations. When we see a technology saying, we can deliver whatever the promises. Are they really performing to what they claim to perform? At least for normal people without necessarily the blockchain background, we hopefully to crystallize that kind of the claims and be able to present with standards across the board that's something you can measure across blockchain technologies that you can measure, you can testify, and you can see the progress for the value uh, you know, blockchain solutions that it bring. So we measure the technologies from different dimensions. The technology performance, for example, the throughput latency fail ratio, as we always know. Scalability, how big is the workload? How big is uh, you know, in, so the network size of the transactions? And the privacy and the security features, and also the, you know, the resources that it consumes this RAM and the fees are really justifiable compared to the traditional uh, transaction methods. These are the claims, I think, yet to be fully discovered from bottom up to see um, whether they are making progress in a way that we'd like them to invest uh, to see. And I feel like it's always good to have some third party uh, independent due diligence agent that will help to reveal that type of truth to investors and even for developers themselves so they know how much really progress they are making compared to other technologies in this space. So do you so see this is what we yeah. Do you see block tests as being that gold standard to use a colloquialism and that's what's going to make you stand out against the competition? Uh, that's what we're trying to help, uh, trying to achieve, yes. Uh, I, I mean the standards needs to be built up together on the consensus, and we are hoping to contribute our share of our understanding about common standards or rules for the value exchange uh, for the blockchain. Okay. Um, did you want to uh, talk about, uh, uh, you know, take uh, J.P. Morgan and your studies there at uh, MIT? Yeah, um, it's so interesting. Like at J.P. Morgan, um, we are already saying. Uh, we have more software developers than IBM. Can you imagine that? I mean, eventually, I think software services and the financial services, they're coming together. They are converging. I think the uh, biggest difference is one is more regulated, another is less. Um, but regulation is means to support the industry development to protect consumer or investors, not to hinder. Uh, any development of the, the, you know, the technology. So I will say eventually we'll see, um, you know, the financial markets or financial services agent like big banks will be just like one of the technology houses, but, you know, acting in a more responsible way for its fiduciary duties for investors uh, with a full set of, you know, compliance, uh, you know, in mind in implementation. Um, but I do not see why they should be different in business nature. No, no I don't either. Uh, your space that you're in is um, 
it's more open than some, but not as open as others when it comes to female entrepreneurs. So give us the landscape coming from a, a, a female breaking through different barriers in the blockchain space. I'd like to hear from you about that industry sector and, and the culture uh, of accepting as peers, equal peers, female and male entrepreneurs in this space. Right. Um, when I was doing investment banking, I found often I was the only female in a big room about transactions, right, to happen. And that is no better when I come to technology space or even felt more lonely sometimes. Uh, the entire panel of the conferences, I'm often the only female. Um, but needless to say, I think I think there are a lot of you know girls in the younger generation. They are interested in uh, you know what fancy technology are bring to us. But I find the big difference uh, is still about uh, confidence. Um, we've been trying like block test. We've been trying to hire by all means you know the most talented girls. It's almost like we have a little bit you know bias <clears throat> try to encourage more girls. But it's very, very hard. Like you often see girls saying, um, you know, I'm very interested. As I'm just not too sure I'm very qualified. You know, never hear such claims from guys in the interview. This is like personal, you know, observation. So I feel like still there's probably still that sort of inherent confidence that in you know, girls uh, that needs to be further encouraged, like saying technology is equal, uh, you know, equalizer for the future career. Uh, in the situations that there's less value about, you know, like office time, a face time in office, or it's more sort of encouragement about individual contribution. Um, and the women are, you know, just as smart and as intelligent um, as female, uh, as a man in that space. And definitely I would like to speak out to say girls just, start coding and start working on your own favorite projects. And this is an equal place for everyone to benefit. I think that the, the gig economy really is gonna help prove that out because with less time in the boardroom, more time outside as, as freelancers, there, I, I think it's the results that are gonna, gonna matter more so than um, the, the posturing of the egos that uh, go up to make the current boards that, that are really making the decisions. Now, would you agree with that? Absolutely, yes. Uh, well, still in the past, you know, uh, I feel still there's so much emphasis on the FaceTime in office, right? Like from A to eight. Uh, if you are exempt yourself saying, I'm taking flexible time working frame, like most of mother, working mothers too, you are almost automatically sort of moving out of, you know, next promotion rate as green. Um, there's still that sort of deep rooted perception about, you know, the devotion of the work uh, matters more than the value creation or results-based valuation model. I think, you know, just Michael, as you were saying, you know, moving into result-based, uh, you know, this society, I think women will be evaluated more equally uh, given the chance they are gonna be offered. I agree with you. Jennifer, we're, we're out of time, but it doesn't mean we can't have you back and discuss this more in depth at, a, at another interview. I really appreciate you taking the time to be on our show today. Thank you so much, Michael. My pleasure. You've been watching CEO Money with Michael Yorba. Thanks for joining with us. Don't forget, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.